on World News Tonight. Relentless attacks. Russia is taking no prisoners when it comes to the warfare in Ukraine. New reports reveal shocking strikes on civilian concentrated areas, rendering many trapped or fatally injured. Optimistic signs. Ukraine and Russia may be able to find middle ground sooner than expected as fresh peace talks turn somewhat fruitful, having significant progress in the conditions of the truce. COVID concerns. Shanghai is now facing new waves of infections. The country grapples with caseloads not seen since the beginning of the pandemic, prompting strict restrictions despite these citizens are hopeful for a way out. And a night of glamour. Miss World contestants shine bright while donning gorgeous gowns and crowns. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with updates on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. In Ukraine, they are in need for the new American firepower as Russia steps its deadly attacks, hitting more and more civilian targets. Doctors at a hospital in Mariupol are struggling to keep up after a deadly attack on a theater where people had taken shelter. With round-the-clock, earth-shaking bombings, Russia is turning Ukrainian cities in its crosshairs into a living hell. At a hospital in Mariupol, doctors struggle to handle the flood of injuries and dead. Many of the images are too graphic to broadcast, but what we can air shows naked Russian brutality against a captive population. Ukrainian officials say Russian forces bombed a theater used as a shelter in Mariupol and took over another hospital, locking in hundreds of civilians, doctors and patients as human shields. Elsewhere, Russia bombed a market in Kharkiv. Slava Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. While President Zelensky had Congress on its feet, President Vladimir Putin gave his own speech, angry and rambling. He accused the West of trying to cancel Russia and called the Ukrainian government Nazis pursuing nuclear and biological weapons, including COVID. He vowed to cleanse Western-minded Russians, calling them traitors, not the talk of a man who seems interested in peace. In Kharkiv's regional infectious disease hospital, doctors must make the choice between leaving critical ill COVID patients connected to oxygen supply in their rooms or moving them to the safety of the bomb shelter, risking their lives. In Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city, which has been under Russian attack for weeks, an impossible dilemma is unfolding for Pavlo Nortov, the director of the regional infectious diseases hospital. To either move critically ill COVID patients to the safety of the bomb shelter in the hospital's basement or leave them connected to the oxygen supply in their rooms. Employees and patients able to walk come down here. But you know, most of our patients are on oxygen supply all the time. They can't be cut off oxygen. The ones in critical condition remain in their rooms. If we bring them down here, they will simply die. The regional emergency service said on Wednesday that at least 500 residents of the city have been killed since the start of Russia's invasion on February 24th. A Kharkiv official said on Tuesday that more than 600 buildings have been destroyed, including schools, nurseries and hospitals. Nartov is relieved his hospital has been spared for now, but staff are preparing for the worst, having stocked up on medical supplies before the invasion began. The situation is difficult and tense. As you can see, sick people, covered windows, bombardment going on from morning till night. Thank God our territory, our hospital, has not yet been hit. The staff are now learning how to use a gas mask in case of a chemical attack. Natalia Titarenko, who works at the hospital, said the building she lives in and the building of her sister had both recently been hit by Russian shells. Suddenly, we heard a sharp noise. My husband said they hit the house. There was a cloud of dust in the apartment, and our neighbors started screaming. I opened the door. It was not damaged. I opened it, and I saw in the yard a smoke curtain, dust, glass smashed everywhere. Russia says it does not target civilians, describing its actions as a special operation to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. 
a move the country and its allies call a baseless pretext for war. Even as U.S. President Joe Biden's position on a no-fly zone did not change after Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky's urgent appeal to the United States Congress for military help to fend off a Russian invasion, President Biden is adamant in providing more security assistance to Ukraine. U.S. President Joe Biden announced an additional $800 million in security assistance to Ukraine on Wednesday, saying that America will continue to give Ukraine weapons to fight and defend itself. It includes 800 anti-aircraft systems to make sure the Ukrainian military can continue, to, can continue to stop the planes and helicopters that have been attacking their people. Biden's position on a no-fly zone did not change, despite an urgent appeal by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to the U.S. Congress. Russia has turned the Ukrainian sky into a source of death for thousands of people. Biden said the U.S. will supply 9,000 anti-armor systems, drones, and 7,000 small arms, such as machine guns, shotguns, and grenade launchers, that will help civilians defend their country. Biden has referred to the creation of a no-fly zone over Ukraine as World War III, and the Pentagon has refused requests to send fighter jets to Ukraine. In the third week of conflict, which Russia calls a special military operation, Russian forces kept up their bombardments of besieged cities. The U.S. Embassy in Kiev said Russian forces had shot dead 10 people waiting in line for bread in Chernihiv, though Russia denied responsibility, saying the incident was a hoax. Footage broadcast on Ukrainian TV Wednesday showed bodies lying on the ground outside a building as an ambulance arrived. Local officials said Russian forces fired on a convoy of evacuees from Mariupol and bombed a theater where civilians were sheltering. The number of casualties was not yet known. Russia denies targeting civilians. More than three million refugees have now fled to neighboring countries. The streets of the capital, Kiev, were largely empty after authorities imposed a 35-hour curfew as Zelensky made an impassioned plea directly to Biden. I wish you to be the leader of the world. Being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace. While Biden forcefully condemned Russian President Vladimir Putin for the continued assault on Ukraine. I think he is a war criminal. Russia's war against Ukraine is entering its fourth week and the death toll on both sides is mounting up. However, there could be some hope on the horizon. Senior officials from both sides say the two countries have made progress in drawing up a 15-point plan to end the war, but amid negotiations remain extremely complex. The plan on the table right now includes Ukraine renouncing its ambitions to join NATO and a ceasefire and Russian military withdrawal. Russia and Ukraine have reportedly made significant progress on reaching a tentative peace deal. According to numerous media outlets, including the Financial Times and Sputnik, negotiators from the two countries have discussed the proposed deal in full for the first time. The 15-point draft includes a ceasefire and Russian withdrawal, with Kyiv having to accept neutrality and curbs on its armed forces. In addition, Ukraine has to give up its bid to join NATO. Despite projected optimism over efforts to end the war, Ukrainian officials accuse Russian forces of shelling a convoy of cars carrying fleeing civilians. They explain the city of Mariupol has been enduring a humanitarian catastrophe for days now, including an airstrike on a theater where hundreds of displaced people were believed to have been sheltering. The UN says over 700 civilians have been killed since Russia launched its invasion on February 24th. Saying this includes over 50 children, the UN added the actual figures might be even higher. The International Court of Justice has also ordered that Moscow immediately halt its invasion, saying it's, quote, profoundly concerned by Russia's actions in Ukraine. While the court's rulings are binding, the ICJ has no direct means of enforcing them and countries have ignored them in the past. President Putin has again reiterated that Russia's goal in Ukraine is to achieve a neutral status for the country. This, he says, refers to Ukraine's demilitarization and denazification. In a bid to contain the most intensive inflation the United States has seen since the 1970s, the Federal Reserve has decided to raise its target for short-term interest rates by 25 basis points. This is the first time the Fed has hiked rates in three years. For the first time since 2018, the U.S. Federal Reserve raised interest rates by a quarter of a percentage point. 
The policy setting Federal Open Market Committee on Wednesday decided to increase the federal funds rate to a range of 0.25 percent to 0.5 percent. For consumers and businesses, this increase in short-term interest rates will mean higher rates for loans. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell explained that the measure is to restore price stability amid sky-high inflation that has been running at the highest levels in four decades. Powell expressed some optimism, forecasting that the hike in interest rates would be a stepping stone for stable growth. Although the invasion of Ukraine and related events represent a downside risk to the outlook for economic activity, FOMC participants continue to foresee solid growth. As shown in our summary of economic projections, the median projection for real GDP growth stands at 2.8 percent this year, 2.2 percent next year, and 2 percent in 2024. But the GDP growth projected for this year is lower than what had been forecast in December. Back then, Fed policymakers had expected the economy to grow by 4 percent at a time when the biggest economic threat was thought to be the pandemic. But now the Fed has detected new risks facing the global economy, mainly the invasion of Ukraine and spiking commodity prices. The Fed also believes inflation will stay above its annual 2 percent target, even with six more interest rate adjustments expected between now and the end of this year. The central bank's policymakers expect inflation to remain elevated at 4.1 percent until the end of 2022. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson met with UAE's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed as part of efforts to secure additional oil and increase pressure on Russian President Vladimir Putin over Ukraine. According to Johnson's office, the Prime Minister stressed the need to work together to stabilize the global energy market. Johnson and the Crown Prince also agreed on the need to bolster security, defense and intelligence cooperation to counter threats including from Houthi forces who have fought a lengthy conflict in Yemen against Saudi and UAE forces. Following the meeting, PM Johnson also met with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman but failed to secure commitments from Saudi Arabia to step up oil production. PM Johnson also said that he had understanding from his meeting with the Saudis that instability in world markets from a spike in energy prices caused by the UK crisis was not in their interests. Johnson is also the second major Western leader to visit Saudi Arabia since journalist Jamal Khashoggi's 2018 killing by Saudi government agents in Istanbul. Now on an update on the COVID crisis around the globe. As the Omicron variant continues to spread across China, it is pushing the country's zero COVID policy to the brink. Food deliveries are being passed over barriers and under gates to some Shanghai residents who are currently locked down in residential compounds. In a bid to help stem rising COVID-19 infections but prevent a widespread citywide lockdown, the local government is placing restrictions on these compounds where suspected or detected cases have been found. Around the mega city of around 25 million, people have also been queuing for COVID-19 tests after 10 cases were reported on Tuesday. Although case numbers are few by global standards, Shanghai, alongside the rest of the country, is battling its worst flare-up of infections since the virus emerged in Wuhan in 2020. Despite this, residents like Eric Choi are optimistic. It's hard to describe the current state with one word. On the surface, it looks very tight for everyone. In fact, people are not very nervous. We receive nucleic acid tests and everything is in an orderly manner. In the past 10 weeks, China has reported at least 14,000 new local symptomatic cases, more than in all of 2021. The wave is being driven by the Omicron variant and is fueling fears from experts that China's strict zero COVID policy is no longer sustainable as parts of the country are struggling to contain cases and are scrambling to test populations and quarantine the infected. In the northeastern province of Jilin, which borders North Korea and is the hardest hit region in the current outbreak, affected cities are racing to prepare temporary hospitals. The province's 24 million residents are also banned from leaving without notifying the local police. Although China has a vaccination rate of nearly 90 percent, experts believe not enough of the elderly have received boosters. It is also unclear how well Chinese vaccines reduce the risk of developing the disease caused by Omicron. 
French Health Minister Olivier Véran said the current rebound of de daily new COVID-19 infections should peak by the end of the month, adding that France had been right to lift most restrictions put in place to contain the pandemic. An epidemic rebound just as France began relaxing its COVID-19 restrictions. The country recorded over 116,000 new cases over a 24-hour period on Tuesday, the highest daily infections rate in over a month. Hospital admissions, which had been on the decline, also stabilized at around 5,700 in the past week. Yet French Health Minister Olivier Véran defended the government's strategy and said the easing of restrictions was not to blame for the latest peak. The French health minister struck a reassuring tone, saying the current rebound was expected to last a couple of weeks before fading and was unlikely to turn into a sixth wave. He also said there was little risk of health services becoming saturated, as the current Omicron variants were mild and a majority of the population was either vaccinated or recently contaminated. The health minister also insisted on the fact that a second booster shot was now available for those aged 80 and above. But Olivier Véran urged the French to remain vigilant, as he acknowledged that complacency may have led to the current epidemic rebound. A 7.3 magnitude earthquake hit eastern Japan, killing at least four people and injuring over 100 others and cutting power to millions of homes. The earthquake struck a matter of days after Fukushima marked the 11th anniversary of the earthquake, tsunami and subsequent nuclear disaster that devastated the region in March 2011. Let's cross over to Adhidharna World News Special Correspondent Anjali Vijay Ratna, who joins us now from Fukuoka in Japan for more. Anjali. Yes, Shinali. The quake hit off the coast of Japan's eastern Fukushima prefecture. A tsunami adversary was issued after the quake for the coastal prefectures of Fukushima and Miyagi, but was lifted soon after the Japan Prime Minister Fumio Kishida later said no abnormalities had been detected at any of the country's nuclear plants. About an hour and a half after the earthquake struck, an 8-inch tsunami occurred along the coastline of Japan's Miyagi prefecture. People injured from the quake have been taken to hospitals in Fukushima, Soma City, without specifying the number of people injured. Power has also been restored in all of Tokyo. The Metrology Agency urged the public to watch out for more seismic activities in the next few days. Masaki Nakamura urged people in affected areas to stay away from the coast and not to enter the sea until tsunami adversaries have been lifted. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharana World News Pressure Correspondent Anjali Vijay Ratna reporting from Fukuoka in Japan. North Korea is suspected of launching a missile that has exploded in mid-air. The alarming updates come amid frequent warnings from other countries on North Korea's exponential increase in the frequency of launching these missiles. North Korea launched a suspected missile that appeared to explode shortly after liftoff over Pyongyang on Wednesday, South Korea's military said. It came amid reports that the nuclear-armed North was seeking to test-fire its largest missile yet. The United States and South Korea have warned that North Korea may be preparing to launch an intercontinental ballistic missile at full range for the first time since 2017. That would be in violation of UN Security Council resolutions. Shin Sung Ki, a research fellow at the Korea Institute for Defense Analyses in Seoul, said North Korea appeared to be reactivating its nuclear and missile power facilities. Pyongyang is trying to rapidly reach a certain level of military achievement by developing, testing and evaluating its nuclear development and various new guided weapons, as they had aimed and planned. The latest projectile was fired from the international airport in Sunan, outside Pyongyang, South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said in a statement adding that it's presumed it failed immediately after launch. A U.S. Department of State spokesperson said it was a, quote, ballistic missile launch and condemned it as a violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions. North Korea has not tested an ICBM or nuclear bomb since 2017, but has said it could resume such testing because denuclearization talks with the United States are stalled.
Welcome back to World News tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The United Nations says it received only 1.3 billion US dollars in pledges towards a 4.27 billion dollar aid plan this year for a war-torn Yemen. More than 17 million people in Yemen currently need food assistance and the United Nations predicts that the figure could rise to 19 million in the second half of the year. Tesla is suspending production at its Shanghai factory for two days, according to a notice sent internally and to suppliers as China tightens COVID restrictions to curb the country's latest outbreak. India is rolling out measures to help the country become a major exporter of high-quality wheat as importers scramble for supplies after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. British Iranian aid worker Nazani Zaghari Ratcliffe and dual national Anushe Ashuri arrived in Britain from Iran, ending an ordeal during which they became a bargaining chip in Iran's talks with the West over its nuclear program. Parliamentarians are proposing amending Kenya's forest laws to make it easier to change the borders of protected areas, a move activists warn that could adversely affect wildlife and the environment in East African country. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. Karolina Bileska from Poland was named Miss World 2021 in the 70th edition of the pageant in San Juan in Puerto Rico. Along with this, Said Greenwood, the first woman from Sri Lanka to advance in the Miss World competition in 43 years, also advanced to the top 40 list as as a judge's choice. We are leaving you tonight with visuals of the crowning celebrations of the competition. Thank you for watching us again. Good night.